now. Because some of us were here for first service. Write a few things down, even if you don't feel like they're particularly significant. Because some of us feel like, ah, you know, I, I think I've let most things go. I don't really have anything too pressing. Uh, but as I did reflect, I, I came up with a few things. And even just the act of folding that up and putting it in the, uh, in the, the burn barrel, coming back in and just feeling a sense of like, huh, I feel lighter. I feel, I feel like something's happened there, right? Just in the sense of releasing something over the Lord, saying, Lord, this is yours. Uh, I, I want you to take it and, and uh, I don't want to carry it anymore. So for you, you may not even think that there's particularly really highly significant things. Uh, just write, write things down. If they're coming to your mind, write them down and then I'm going to encourage you to come out and, and uh, drop that in the book. And the reason why I'm asking you to put down not only the good, the, the, the negative things, right? Those things are like, oh, you know, I, I feel like I'm being held back because I'm blaming or I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like this has happened to me and I'm blaming God or I'm blaming people around me or there's a person. Uh, there's also really good things that I want you to write down. And let me give you an example. I love my children. One of them is right here. But the baby stage was not a particularly wonderful time, right? I didn't feel like, oh, I love the baby stage. Whereas some people love the baby stage, right? You're like, oh, I wish my kids could all be babies, right? And what we can find is actually we may not be able to release our children if we feel like, I love that. I just want to kind of remember that and I want to kind of keep you in that kind of mold of being my baby for the rest of my life. That actually does something detrimental to children as they grow older, right? So that's just one small way in which you can, you can feel like, oh, this is wonderful, I love this thing, but it, it can actually be a detriment, right? So, so some of us, we can, we can do that with our, with our families or with our personal life, but we can do that in, in congregational life too, right? It's like, oh, this is just so wonderful, and I want to capture that moment, and there's nothing wrong with the memory. It's that when it becomes formational, we start to think, I have to go back to that, right? I want to revisit that, and I want to, to kind of return to that, where it can become a detriment, because what if God says, I want to do something wholly new, and it doesn't involve what I've done in the past. It, it involves something wholly new. And we're saying, well, I don't really want to let go of that. That's why it's important to let go of not only of those really difficult, traumatic things or the painful things, but also those things that we may be holding on to as celebration points, as, as a kind of glory moments. So that's what I want to encourage you to do. And, and here's how it fits in. That Isaiah 42 is a, a, a people in exile. And I've talked about that before where Jerusalem was basically leveled by the Babylonians. They came in, they took all the people back, and they resettled them back in Babylon. And the Israelites didn't want to be in Babylon. And, and they felt like God had abandoned them. And in some ways, it feels like, and, and as I reflect on my own ministry here in this congregation, it feels like a bit of a season of exile. It feels a bit like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Uh, uh, not really sure, right? What is God up to? And I believe that we are actually coming out of a season of exile. That I believe God wants to do something wholly new. And this text has particular application for us as a congregation, I believe. Where God says, I am coming and I want you to be ready. And I want you to testify to the fact that not only am I with you in the present, but I was with you even in the exile. And I was with you pre-exile. And I was with you throughout the ages. And so it's important for us to recognize that. So if you want to kind of uh, uh, see this in a nutshell, uh, then here's, here's how you can. Uh, I forgot all of those. Uh, oh, there we go. There we go. Here's, here's how you can. Uh, it's that God wants to do something new. And he's about to do something new. And, uh, and I don't have a corner on what that all looks like. And I've said that a few times. But that's just my sense. That... God wants to do something new, and He is going to do something new, and He wants you to be part of it. And, uh, and this is a time of engagement, and this is a time of crying out to Him and, uh, and coming in for Him. And so I trust that last week was helpful for you as you reflected personally on those areas of your life that maybe you don't want to think about. Maybe those, those particular areas that God is saying, I want you to surrender this over, or you have an issue in this area, or you're holding something back here. And hopefully you took that sheet home last week and, and were able to spend some time reflecting on that. But here's uh, the sermon in a nutshell. That, um, that basically when God begins to do something new, when God wants to do something new, expect pain. Expect difficulty. And that's what we see uh, uh, throughout, throughout life. And we'll talk a little more about that. And, but remember that through that pain and difficulty, that, that we have a really wonderful guide through that. And Jesus is our guide, and Jesus carries us, and he leads us, and he leads us through the pain to the other side. And ultimately, as we're in it and beyond it, 
we are called to be witnesses. And, and think, uh, you can think church witness, well, you know, I'm going to testify or I'm going to witness in the community. Or you can think courtroom. The importance and the need for people to give good, accurate, true testimony. That's what witnesses do. And that's what God needs in the world. He needs people to share about what is true and right and good about Him and about the reality of the world. Because we live in a world that says, ah, truth is, ah, there is really no truth is what you want to make it. And God says, no, I am truth, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the, if, if my people don't stand up and proclaim truth and live truth, then the world won't have any clue what truth is. And if we believe, if we develop this kind of theological idea that in the pain, God is absent, right? That I'm experiencing pain. Where are you, God? And God says, I am right there with you. And in fact, I'm leading you into the pain. And I want you to see that and know that so that you can testify to the world that even in pain, your God is with you. And He cares for you. And He will guide you through that. Okay? And if we, we, if we don't see that, then we risk believing in that our God only offers really good, happy, pleasant moments. And somehow our God is absent from us in the pain. And that's not at all the reality. And so our world needs to hear, I am going through deep pain. I am experiencing really great difficulty. And I'm believing that God is with me. And I'm knowing that God is with me. And sometimes it takes years for us to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, I now can see how God was with me. But in the moment, I didn't really understand it or I couldn't really feel it. But I had to just trust by faith. Okay? So there it is in a nutshell. I probably don't need to say any more than that. But uh, Isaiah says it a whole lot better than me. And so let's pray and then we will, we will turn, uh, turn our hearts there. Father, thank you that you are good and right and true. And thank you that you're not that in the abstract. You are that in the personal. You are good and right and true. And not only that, you are loving. You are benevolent. You are caring. You are generous. You are kind and patient with us as individuals. And so Jesus, I pray that we would sense that and know that through the pain and through the mountaintop experiences. That as you do not forsake us, we would not forsake you. As you do not abandon us, we would not abandon you. That you walk with us and you call us into those deep, difficult waters. And you say, you will not drown, my child. I will be there with you in those deep, dark, overwhelming waters. And so, Father, I pray for each person here, Lord. For those that are, are feeling like they are drowning. For those that are feeling like they are being burned up. Lord, would you remind them. You have said, I will not let you drown. And you will not be overcome by those deep powers. I am there with you. And I know you and I love you. And I will care for you. And so let's speak. And Lord, would your arms of love be wrapped around us today. And God, I pray you bring to mind, even in these next few moments, specific situations, specific things that you want us to offer back to you. And say, Lord, take this. I no longer want to carry this. I want you to have it back. And as we burn those pieces of paper, Lord, may they be symbolic of true, real actions that we've committed to in our own lives and hearts to let go and trust you. Lead us down, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 42. Uh, before we get to 43, let me just really quickly touch on verse 42. And I'm going to encourage you to go home. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because I actually want to invite Ron Davis, our chairperson, to, to do a little Q&A with me because I, I think it's really important right in this season of our congregation that you hear some testimony, some words of witness from our, our board chair who's also a human being as well. Ron, Ron has a personal story as well. And you're going to hear that too. And it's important for us to recognize that we all have stories. We all have things that Christ is doing in us. And sometimes they're hard and sometimes they're joyous. Uh, but what we need to be doing is to be sharing that with one another so that we recognize, oh, now I know your story. Now I understand. And by the way, I relate to that story because there's so much overlap between uh, what God is doing uh, in each of our lives. Isaiah 42 begins like this. So remember, this is a, this is a, a people in exile. They no longer have a homeland. They've been taken away to a, a, a nation that doesn't worship their God, who has completely different culture, completely different customs, completely different language, and they are now establishing themselves in this country, and they're wondering, where is God? And it says this in verse 14 of chapter 42. It says, um, 
sorry, I better find that. Chapter 13, verse 42. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry. And with triumph over his enemies. For a long time, I have kept silence, God says. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, but now, and here's what I want you to see. The pathway to new, because we're leading to the new in chapter 43. The pathway to the new is painful. Okay? Now listen to this. God says, but now, and by the way, painful even for God. Right? It's painful for us as people, but it's painful for God himself. And he says, for a long time I've kept silent. He says, but now like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp, I pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways unknown. Let me just pause here and say two things. One, I haven't been blind, but I can imagine for somebody who is blind, the familiar is your best friend. The path that is familiar is the path that you long to walk on. Because you know that path, and you know it, so you don't have to see. And God says, I will lead the blind by the unfamiliar path. I wouldn't want to be there. That sounds painful to me for the blind. And by the way, I've never directly experienced childbirth. Some of you have. Okay? I understand it to be painful. Uh, I've experienced three births. One was my own. I don't remember anything about it, but I'm sure it was painful. And the birth of our two children. And recognizing the pain that comes. You see, even in one of the most significant moments that we have as human beings, and that is a birth moment, there is pain that comes before the birth. And I can talk to you all day long about the power of pain and how God uses pain and how even Jesus Christ himself, God himself, experienced pain and suffering, experienced rejection from his, with, within his own people. People misunderstood him. People didn't get it. And even in the very end, as he's hanging on the cross, entirely and utterly rejected by all people. You want to talk about pain, the pain of the cross, the pain of rejection. Why? Because pain is the pathway to the new. And we see, and you could say, well, that was Jesus, and Jesus had to endure that, but now it's the New Testament, and beyond that, it's all, look at the Apostle Paul, and he will show you his resume of being shipwrecked three times, of being beaten, 40 lashes minus one, beaten with rods, stoned, he was uh, uh, naked, and, and just incredible stuff. Why? Because God knows the power of pain to lead us to himself. To help us to recognize that actually pain shows us what's really happening, what's really going on, has a way of bringing that to the surface so that we can go, oh, wait a minute, what's this pain about? Oh, I need to come back to God or I need to deal with whatever the area of pain is. Some of us want to run from pain. Some of us don't want anything to do with pain, and yet pain is a pathway to the new. And if we're not prepared to go through the pain, we will not be able to enter the new territory. And even God himself goes through seasons of pain. So where are you experiencing pain? Where are those areas that if you were to take a long, hard look, you would recognize that that, is, yeah, that causes a deep pain and sadness? And have you spent time there? And have you spent time looking for God in the midst of that? Or have you attempted to run? And as we think about that from a congregational perspective, and the pain that this congregation has gone through, and believing that actually there is new on the other side of that pain, and yet there is no shortcut to pain. There is no shortcut to um, to this. And I'll leave you to read through the rest of chapter 42, but God doesn't leave his people there. He says, actually, you've been in exile for a season, and now I'm about to do something wholly new. I'm going to bring you out. And the next thing I want you to know is that I am your guide, and the guide to the new is loving. Verse 43, we've already read it earlier, but this is what the Lord says. He created you, O Jacob. 43 and verse 1 and following. He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, it doesn't say you will not pass through the waters. No. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, 
They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, it doesn't say you will no longer have to walk through fire. No, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And some of us have been burned. And some of us have not claimed that promise that God says you will not be burned. You see, with me, you will not be burned. Are you trusting me? Have you surrendered that over to me? Or have you stood there saying, I've been burned. I've been burned. God says, you will not be burned. Will you trust me? Will you surrender to me? Will you allow me to walk with you through the fire, through the flames, through the waters? The flames will not set you ablaze, for the I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are mine. I want you to hear that particularly, specifically. You are mine, Jesus. You are mine, Ingrid. You are mine, Tim. You are mine, Sylvia. You are mine, Ruth. You are mine, Shane. You are mine, Alan. You are mine, Alan. You are mine, Jen. See, God says that in the particular, in the specific. Know that no matter what you face, you are mine. No one can snatch you away. And I have a plan. So will you trust me through pain? Or will you try to run from me? And will you try to see something happen prematurely when I am walking with you through this season? What goes on in verse 6 and following? And God says, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. He's not talking about his exiled people. Coming back home. I will say to the north, says, bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed in me. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, and who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together. So what we see is God saying, I'm going to do this. And the nations are going to gather together. And they're going to claim their own victories. It's because of, it's because of the strength of Babylon. That Israel was exiled. So it's the strength and the power of Babylon. And it says, which, which of them foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things. Let them bring their witnesses to prove they were right. So that others may hear and say, it is true. Yeah, we agree with those nations that are saying, it's the strength of Babylon. It's the strength of Assyria that overcame God's people. And today we can do the same thing. It's by my bank account that I am surviving. It's because I have a great job that my life is good. It's because I have a wonderful family that I'm blessed. Right? And we can start to think that somehow we have a part in that. That somehow our strength, our power, our giftedness, our, our skills, our passions have led us to the place we are. Instead of seeing it actually, what does God say? You are my witnesses and my servant who I, whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there ever be one after me. That I am God, and I am your Savior. You haven't saved yourself. You'll never be able to save yourself. And in a moment, your life can be snatched from you. And in that moment, you will not be able to say, it's because of this, or because of that, or because of that. We simply say, it is because of the Lord. The Lord has given. The Lord can take away. And God can bring us into exile, and God can bring us out of exile. And God can bring us through times of pain, and God brings us out of times of pain. And it's all God's work. And are we able to stand and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I don't fully understand, but if you're leading me into a season of pain, I will trust that it is you who is leading me there, and you who will lead me out of it. Or am I going to start to point my fingers and say, it's because of this. It's because of that. It's because of that. If that was only different, if that person didn't, if, if only God had done this for me. See, we can start to turn our fingers of accusation toward other people, other situations, toward our God. And God says, don't you realize that I'm actually leading you into this? Don't you realize that it's for your good that I am taking you into these places? Will you trust me? We believe that I have a plan in the midst of it. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed that I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. 
If we do not witness, and I don't just mean verbal witness, I mean with our lives, if we do not demonstrate to a hurting world that our God cares for, loves us, and saves us, and will care for, and love, and save the people around us, then there is no hope. Uh, we are the only ones that God has given this message to. And if we can't even live in it, if we can't even trust Him in the midst of it, uh, then, uh, then God will have to come in, in entirely different ways than He has ever come in the past. Because it's only through His witnesses, His people, that the world comes to realize, ah, oh, this God is a name, and His name is Jesus. And He Himself has endured suffering and pain beyond anything imaginable. And his followers have endured suffering and pain beyond imagination. And there is hope beyond the pain and suffering. There is resurrection. And we trust God. So we become the witnesses to the man. And as we trust God in this pain, and as we trust that he is our guide and he is our loving guide, then we can witness to that reality. We can tell people, my God is faithful, my God is true, regardless of what I experience or what I come into, into God is going to lead. I'm going to invite Ron, <clears throat> Ron DeVisser, the chair of our ministry council, to come, and uh, we're going to do a little Q&A for the rest of our time together. And uh, this is this is partly Ron's story, partly, partly the story of our ministry council, partly the story of our congregation. And I want to encourage you, again, to be thinking about this piece of paper. What is your story? What are the things that you uh, would like to write down on here? What are helpful things to be able to take and, um, and give back to God? And so, Ron, yeah, come on, come on up. And uh, Ron's reluctant, right? You don't want to be here. This is not Ron's choice that he's here. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I've been sensing, you know, it's good for you to Ron, and it's good for you to hear his heart beyond just being the ministry council chair, although that's a significant role. So Ron, part of the uh, part of the journey uh, uh, is that even before Ron was chairperson, uh, I, I um, took a course at the Master Divinity College, and just audited a week-long course on church leadership, and we were encouraged to bring with us the board chair, and I sensed that I should ask Ron, who wasn't on the ministry council at the time, uh, Ron, would you come? With me? Would you t take this course in? And, and Ron said, "Sure, I, I, I can do that." And so we spent a week together learning. And little did Ron know that um, within a few months, his very first ministry council meeting, he would be appointed the chair. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that experience and, and some of the experiences since then. Um, but uh, uh, well, let's just jump right in. It's not good. All right. Uh, so one of our most important roles as God's people is that of being his witnesses, testifying to what God has done in our lives, our families, our communities. Uh, so what have you witnessed God doing, uh, both highs and lows, in HMC's life during your time? Uh, I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad anyone who knows me, I'm glad you gave me the questions beforehand because um, we have 16 minutes. <laughs> And I could probably talk for a half hour on any of these questions. And um, so I'm, I'm probably going to read some of them to try to keep it concise. Um, but I, I do want to start with that. Um, the, uh, I want you to know uh, the Lord is my Lord and Savior. He is, uh, he rules my life. Um, he, I believe he is in control. Uh, I struggle with that sometimes because I like being in control. Um, but he is in control of my life and as I get older, I learn that more and more. I learn to trust him more and more. And um, so I just, I just want to start with that comment. Um, there, there certainly have been lows in the, in the, in the uh, past years. Um, there's been, uh, we've, you know, we've seen people leaving our congregation because of decisions that have been made. Uh, conversely, there's people who have been leaving our congregation because changes are not being made fast enough. Uh, I know uh, another low is, is uh, seeing uh, some of the damaging, hurtful conversations uh, that have played out between members of, in our congregation. <clears throat> Conversations that have not 
assumed the best. Congregations that have, us, have assumed actually the worst of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I think God is working in all of us. I think he's stirring in our hearts and minds, uh, causing us to sort out what we do as a congregation and why. I see a very deep care for each other uh, around those, uh, you know, of those around us, but not limited to those inside our walls. Um, it, it extends congregationally and on a on an individual basis outside these walls into our everyday life. And I think that is a really foundational characteristic of our church's uh, character. That's uh, in the midst of the lows, I have seen God raised up. So even when there's been turmoil in the congregation, in the church, unsure what we're doing uh, or where we're going and what's really happening, I still sense that we realize that that staff, that our pastors, um, that our groups, that our leaders, that the members of our congregation realize that every Sunday, every time we meet, every time we have a conversation with someone, is an opportunity to uh, witness. To that this might be the chance, this might be the time God is calling us, me, we, um, this might be the time the Holy Spirit is going to work through us to reach someone else. And I, I really sense that we understand that, that we continue to do that, that even though there's this turmoil going on, or has gone on, that, that, uh, we really understand the need to serve God uh, in that way. And it's good. It's good. Um, we've also, we've witnessed, uh, you know, we, Pastor Paul left four years ago or so. Um, so, again, in the youth, children and youth area of our church, we saw some mix up some some change going on. But it's 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 developing into something I believe is really uh, beautiful and that is growing. And that is a ministry and, and, and it looks different than the past, but it um, and we're seeing a, uh, the growth of a ministry where family and regular people are involved and have become an integral part of that ministry and that U eighteen ministry. I also see the growth in small groups where we can share and learn, pray, and pray for each other. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, your journey to the, the role of chairperson was a bit unconventional. I just shared a bit about that. And you assumed the role in the midst of a very difficult time in the life of our church. Would you mind sharing a little bit of how that went for you? What happened? How has God shaped you, our ministry council, our congregation, in the time that you assumed that role? So, yeah, um, Ingrid and I have been uh, uh, members of the church probably for. I think, I think we were coming here for about six years before I came on ministry council, and then four, four years we were members. And then I was asked to be on ministry council, which I agreed to. And, uh, and then, um, then, so I went to the first meeting. Okay, and um, within, I think it was within 12, we opened with devotions. And, um, as a new ministry council, you have your elections first. And within about 20 minutes, um, I was chair of ministry council. And um, yeah, so you're, you're sitting there in the chair, you haven't been on ministry council, and all of a sudden these, uh, these questions start getting uh, thrown at you. Is the chair okay? What are we going to do about this? Or what should we go in this direction? And so forth. And the most striking thing about that evening to me was um, was how overwhelmed I felt, how um, how I didn't know why me, and I I remember praying in that moment 
that and, and giving it over to God and saying, look, as good as I think I am, <laughs> um, I can't, it's not by my strength that we're going to sort this out, uh, that we're going to do this. And, um, um, and I just pray for the uh, Holy Spirit, for the strength, and I just, I remember just a peace coming over me, and that it would be okay, and we moved, we moved ahead. I came out of a meeting of mine. <laughs> just barely. Um, I think this experience is informative in a couple of ways. Um, first, our ministry council and our congregation could not have been in a great spot four and a half years ago. If I was, if you will, the last resort as a new member of ministry council to be made chair on that very first day. Second, ministry council is made up of ordinary people like you and me. Uh, if God could just as, as likely have called any one of you to be on ministry council at that time. And sometimes I wish it was more of you. <laughs> um, I don't have the training for this. I didn't go to school for this. Um, I'm a farmer, if you don't know. I love, I, I love farming. I love working with my family on the farm. Um, it is something I believe uh, I was called to do. But God does use ordinary, sinful people like me and others to serve on ministry council and in fact in all areas of the congregation. And not just in the congregation, he calls us in all areas of our lives to serve him. And um, it's by his, his grace. And so, uh, early December, Sean uh, was preaching and it really struck me at that time because I was feeling fairly, uh, I was fairly exhausted. And Sean Humphreys uh, was speaking to us about, and he's saying, uh, calling us, are, are, do you want to be a missionary? Is God calling you to be a missionary? And he said often the response is, uh, I don't have the ability, I can't do this. And Sean said, good. Because now you're in the right spot to be a missionary. Because it's not going to be by your strength that we change people. It's by the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that, that was very significant to me, to, uh, you know, at that time. Uh, hasn't made a missionary out of me yet. But, uh, but it's, it spoke to me in a really significant way that uh, yeah, if, if, if good is going to come, it's going to be God. It's going to be God working through us, and it's not going to be by our own strength. Um, I'm taking a long time. Sorry. Um, it's good. It's, it's uh, I've been. I think I, I've been part of Mr. Council awakening to its responsibility to be spiritual leaders of this congregation. Um, this has become evident as we've worked through strategic directions. I'm just. I've been so blessed the whole time I was in ministry council that I've been on ministry council and by the dedication and the sincerity and the um, just the, the loving and giving of my fellow members on ministry council, how much they've given, how much they've prayed and how hard we're trying to seek the Lord's will. And um, Ministry Council obviously has wrestled with many difficult decisions. We've made mistakes that we've had to apologize and take responsibility for. And we've prayed a lot. And we've prayed a lot. Uh, we have often questioned why us. But we've also said we've been called and therefore uh, we are responsible to seek and to do as well. Personally, uh, I, I align myself with, uh, I, I find a kindred spirit maybe in Jonah, who is a reluctant servant. 
I'm learning to listen better. I've always believed God is in control. But that continues to grow with me and the confidence uh, that I need to have in that. And yet, I struggle to let other things go. I question the gifts God has given me and the purpose I have to use them for. I struggle with my own strength and realizing the limitations of it. So as a, as a congregation, I think we're seeing the same types of things. We are questioning what God wants us to do. We are moving from a congregation of individual groups, so a congregation made up of groups. And I think this is very significant that we're moving to a congregation that has groups in it. We are learning to discuss things together, recognizing we are all trying to serve our best to serve the Lord, even if we got a green. This was not always so. I think we are becoming more trusting of each other. I, in fact, think we are experiencing a spiritual reawakening that is taking us to a more basic form of ministry that requires involvement by each and every one of us. Uh, so, Ron, we're navigating some, some troubled times again, but we know God is on the throne. What have you been hearing from people? How is that affecting you and the rest of the ministry council? And what would you like to say to the congregation today? Through, through this time, I think um, we keep getting reminded uh, that God is a rock. Things change. God doesn't change. As ministry council, we are hearing a lot of things. We are hearing words of support. We are hearing words of question and concern. But the words that weigh the heaviest are the ones that assume we have a hidden agenda. That a person questioning us claims inside knowledge about things we have no idea about. We've also heard and experienced and been the recipient of some very, uh, I would say, hurtful, maybe damaging words that, that is very difficult. I can say uh, that we have made some difficult decisions. We have prayed about them continuously. We have sought outside input. <clears throat> but I do want you to know the overwhelming sense of sadness and pain that was in that ministry council room when it became clear that we would have to ask Pastor Connie to resign. There were tears and questions of why me? And I didn't sign up for this. And can we put this decision off until I am off ministry council? And yet, we knew this decision, we knew this was the decision we had to make. Uh, this time for us as ministry council, and, and I recognize in the congregation as well, but for us on ministry council, it has been physically, mentally, spiritually exhausting for all of us. Thank you, Yeah, so significant. Um, that's a, so significant to hear uh, you share it. Um, deeply vulnerable. And this is the last kind of question, and um, it reflects back to the message, just kind of a summation of, of the message as well. Uh, in Isaiah 43, 14 to 17, God calls his attention to himself and his plans. He reveals a bit about the future, the overthrowing the Babylonians, but also some of the past where he overthrew the Egyptians and rescued. Then he drops this statement in at the end. But forget all that, he says. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? How would you describe, Ron, the something new that God is doing in HMC? And how should we be preparing ourselves? So, you know, no, no master plan or anything like that, but what, you know, what, what are you sensing? So the, the second part of the question is easier to answer for, for me, how to prepare ourselves as a congregation. And I would say individually as well. We need to ask the Lord for forgiveness of sins, both individually and as a group. We need to pray and read scripture as we discern God's will and praise him for his grace and mercy and his sovereignty over our lives and over our church. 
the first part about what is the something new God is doing in HMC. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it's something new, or if it's a time time of renewal, a uh, time of going back to aligning ourselves as a biblically functioning church, as we describe, as we see described in Acts two. And um, this is. Uh, read Acts 2, uh, verse 42 and 40 to 47 reads in part, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer and making disciples. And we worked with this as ministry council this past year as we worked on strategic directions for our congregation. And I think that, that is foundational to the strategic directions. Um, as Minister Council, we've done our best to flesh this out in the strategic directions that were presented in June. Yet, Ministry Council's desire is these directions, in, in, in these directions, was to leave room for the Holy Spirit to act. So, not, to, it, not that it be all regimented. It was, uh, our intention was to leave room for um, these directions that they could be implemented by, uh, by groups in the congregation, by you, by other pastors, and indeed that there be a latitude um, for a new lead pastor where uh, the specifics of that direction, he may see a bit differently, but I think um, I think the core of what we've laid out, the framework we've laid out, if you will, in the strategic directions, is, um, is actually going to be very helpful to a new lead pastor, as uh, I believe it's helpful to us today. There's a lot, a lot in there, a lot, a lot of, a lot to shoot for in there, and so we begin working on it. Practically, as you've mentioned, as much as I would like to be able to lay out a completed plan, I cannot. Um, I find the same is true in my own life. I was a lot sure what I was going to be doing when I was 65, when I was 20, than I am now, you know, seven or eight years away, um, and. The plan is good, but living, living as God wants us to in the moment is what's really important. And He will lead. He will lead in my personal life. He will lead us in our congregational life. But we need to be paying attention to Him. We need to, um, we need to be in prayer as a congregation. We need to study His Word to get to know Him, um, to know what not only what His will for us is. Um, but also so that we can, uh, that how, do we help, how do we tell others about our Savior, our Lord, if we, have, if, if we don't know Him, if we haven't read the Bible so that we know His character, His nature, and, and why, so that we can be excited and, and that we, we can speak with confidence when we tell a people, other people, about, um, about our Savior. And, and how He created us, and how we turn to sin, and how we need a Savior, and how He sent a Savior. It's all in the Bible. We need to study and learn. I know we need to continue um, to celebrate in the Lord. Sunday is so important for coming together as a church family where we can worship, praise, learn, and fellowship together. The months ahead, we're going to be talking to the those trained in support ministry, planning with them the direction that support ministry will take in the future. It may be the same, it may be different, but I do trust that God will show us the way here as well. Another thing I'm seeing, and I think we're going to see more of, is, is sort of, I'm not sure if the word cross activities is right, but um, it, it's working between ministry areas. And it, for example, is the mission planning team going and teaching the U18 on Sunday morning. They did that a couple Sundays, I think. I think they're planning to do that again. So we have expertise in one area helping in another area. And sharing what they've learned working together as a team and what possibilities are there and, and taking that to another area. Um, I, we saw that in the invitation for the slave ride this fall or before Christmas where the midweek ministry uh, they organized something, invited us as a congregation to come 
and sing carols and have time of fellowship <coughs> as a service to us as the rest of the congregation. And I think that's a great thing. Um, an, another, and there's so there's so many of these little pockets, but another one that just uh, excites me is that we have our worship team up here. I know Verdi, but I think some others might be involved in midweek ministry there now. They've, they've, they've gone and used their talents and they're going to the midweek ministry program and teaching and, and training and working with youth to make a youth leadership team, which I think is fantastic. And I hope, and Ferdy actually between services told me that they will be coming and leading worship in the future. This, this is what, this is what uh, we need. This is where I believe we're going to go. And, and I think we need to be involved and invested. Even if we're not spending time or not involved in specific other areas of the church, we need to hold um, we need to hold other areas up in prayer, which is a really, really powerful thing. We need to understand the importance of these other ministry areas to the whole body, even though it may not be important to us today. Um, these directions also require improvement on the part of ministry council, and there's several goals we've set for the coming year, but um, specific to that, um, but well, one of them is to improve, is, is attempt to improve communication with the congregation. Um, we, 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 understand, we, we know we don't do a very good job with that, and I can go into all the reasons, but we don't do a good job with that. So one, one of the things we're going to uh, try is, um, is every month we're going to put just four or five bullet points in the, in the bulletin about what ministry council is working on. And the goal of that isn't just communication. Part of the goal of that is to stimulate discussion in the congregation amongst yourselves. Um, to stimulate, uh, then hopefully from that conversation to us as ministry council and to the rest of the leadership of the church. And, and perhaps a letter, or perhaps uh, invite us to have a cup of coffee. One of us from ministry council, there's six of us, invite us to have a cup of coffee. Um, invite us home after church. and. Uh, if you don't want it to be too long a lunch, you invite someone other than me. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, two, two or three years ago, Ministry Council members, we committed to not talk about Ministry Council stuff on the foyer on Sunday mornings, not to become a, a huddle of Ministry Council out in the foyer, because we believe that all of us are members of this congregation. We want to fellowship and worship with you. Um, we want to be open to discussion with anyone. Um, and it just happens that the area we're serving on is ministry council, not praise team or, or some other area, which many of us are on more areas. But um, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I just want to, to, to say, uh, please, please feel free to talk to anyone. And Ab specifically said he would be really on board with that. I, I told him that I said at the first service, I, I said that Ab was the only one who talked to people. <laughs> um, and, and these things, and there, as I said, there's so many more where I see these sparks. These, this synergy coming up, these, this new, this, the new birth of things, and it's, it's not taking away at all from what the past is, but it's a change. And um, I see an awareness, an increasing awareness of why we are called together as Hanover Michigan Church. And to me, it's very simple, because God is God with us. I really appreciate you. So I thank you for sharing. I know this is not the, your your kind of idea of a great time, but, uh, <laughs> but I think it's been helpful for the congregation to hear your heart. And, uh, your Mike Cross, former mission council member, you want to pray for Ron? Would that be all right? And we invite you to stand, and then um, we're basically wrapping up. We're a little over time here, so I'm going to encourage you to be scribbling down some things that you can be able to take with you outside to the to the burn barrel, and uh, really we'll just kind of lead right into that.
pray. Lord God, we thank you for Ron and sitting in a position here where uh, he doesn't feel comfortable. You made that known, and Lord, that you would be that that, uh, that portion for him. And for the rest of the council members and people in leadership of this church, that uh, Lord, that you, uh, we would give it over to you each and every moment, and uh, you would continue to help us to grow in these positions, to take bold new steps, and uh, <coughs> to serve where it sometimes feels like the ice is very cold. And Lord, I ask that you bless these people and, and lift them up uh, in these times of uh, seeing the great and through the Lord, we want to praise you and give you all the glory and all the praise uh, from HMC. And uh, in Christ's name, we want to serve you. Amen.